welcome everybody once again to the panel Keeping the Pace on Climate Change Act. And if you're following on social media, please tweet, talk about this. We want to uh, make sure the conversation's heard. Hashtag WEF 23. Let's begin. Gasping for breath. That's how the UN Secretary General described the Paris climate targets to me this week. Gasping for breath. We've had seven years since the deal was agreed to limit global warming in Paris, and we are four years on from when we were all warned here in Davos that our house is on fire. Prescient too, because since 2022 was the hottest year on record. We saw heat waves in Europe, don't worry. <laughs> Droughts another in flood. Latin America. Exactly, another flood. And wildfires in North Africa. Many villages in Pakistan remain submerged from flooding and the search continues for a five-year-old child in California, torn from his mother's arms in a raging creek that followed record storms there too. You know, I watched my colleague, Larry Madawu, who was here in Davos actually, report from Nigeria and he was waist deep in water. There's too many episodes to recount, but suffice to say an estimated 3.3 billion people live in areas of high vulnerability to climate change, yet it took a war in Ukraine, raging inflation, and then a dramatic energy security crisis and fears to kickstart a global response that suddenly seemed to galvanize decent growth in renewable energy investment. But the truth is, and I think we all know it, we need to dramatically raise the pace and the scale of that money. We need to focus investment in emerging and developing nations that will dominate energy demand in the future. And in Secretary Kerry speak, if he doesn't mind me using his words, we need money, money, money. And that's not to say that big nations like the United States, China, Japan, regions like the EU haven't stepped up with tangible support. But the IEA chief reminded me again this week, we need to quadruple current investment in renewables to $4 trillion a year by 2030. It feels like a lot, but what if I told you there's $120 trillion sitting in pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, insurance funds globally, our own money in many respects, searching for returns. If the risks can be minimized or shared, if the opportunities can be clarified, surely we can get <coughs> a fraction more of that. It does mean profound change from business, from governments, from us as consumers too, and requires diverse forms of scientific, indigenous and local knowledge. And we have it, by the way. We just need to listen harder. Then there's the question of sincerity. There are businesses out there that are simply not walking the walk, even as they enthusiastically talk the talk. How do we wash away the greenwashing that too many firms still hide behind? And when it comes to energy, how do we decarbonize sectors like the oil and gas sector faster? Finally, we as consumers, we have to use less energy. And, and richer nations have proved that when prices are high, we do that. We have to continue to do that, even as prices continue to come down. The challenges are daunting, but there are vast opportunities, and you're gonna hear about this too, for innovation, entrepreneurialism, collaboration, and yes, even profits. We are in Davos, of course. Get it right and we could address energy security and sustainable development for many generations to come. Enough from me. Far smarter minds here have all the answers, I promise. Let me introduce our panel. Helena Guruinga, co-founder of the Indigenous Youth Collective of Amazon Defenders. Secretary John Kerry, Special Presidential Envoy for Climate in the United States. Jennifer Morgan, Special Envoy for International Climate Action in Germany. Anna Borg, President and Chief Executive Officer of Vattenfall and Jesper Broden, Chief Executive Officer, Inca Group. Welcome to our panel. I wanna start by just getting a show of hands. And hopefully, we'll see what happens, but we'll come back to this question at the end of the panel. Um, who thinks we will hit the Paris targets to limit global warming to one and a half degrees C by 2030? And just to be clear, that means peak emissions and then virtually halving them by 2030. Hands up if we will hit those targets. Okay. Depends. I sort of make that six and a half people. <laughs> okay. Remember that number. Um, comments on that, Secretary Kerry? 
six and a half people in the room, you understand the concern. I think you share it. Well, I, I, I think the question strips away the possibilities. Um, we can hit 1.5. We're not on track to do it now. Uh, and it's not clear, uh, absolutely clear, that we will get on track. I, I don't know if Jennifer, when she raised her hand, is talking about Germany alone or the globe. I have more confidence in Germany probably being able to do it, yes. Uh, but globally, uh, we're heading towards 2.5, somewhere in the high twos right now. Mm. Um, and we really must turn that around. But to turn it around, is, as you said, think about it. Uh, you have uh, $1 trillion approximately being spent right now in venture capital and new investment, et cetera. But we have to get it up to four and a half every year for the next 30 years. We have to right now be deploying the largest solar field in the world every day for the next years in order to hit the 1.5. We have to be deploying renewables six times faster than we are today. I know that in our country, we've got to pass a permitting bill before we can do that because you can't make a siting. And it can't take 10 years to distribute this stuff. So yes, we can do this. But there is not yet the kind of uh, commitment broadly that is necessary to make it happen. And almost a collective will as if we were at war uh, and, and ready to turn factories into solar panel producers and so forth. I think some of that's what we need. And, uh, but I am hugely encouraged, I mean much more so than I've been at any time in the last years, by what is happening right now which opens up an even greater possibility of achieving this because so much energy is going into, uh, human energy is going into the new technologies. Mm. Uh, and, and these things, the innovations that are occurring are gonna multiply and magnify on themselves. And so I really think, you know, we're, we're the, the fact that the IEA came out and said, if we fulfill all the promises that were made in Glasgow, we would be at 1.8 degrees by 2050. And if we fulfill all the promises added on in Sharm el-Sheikh, we would be at 1.7. So it's heading in the right direction. When we began this exercise, it was going from 3 to 3.5, 3.7. So we have turned this corner. We have moved in the right direction. And now the question is, will we do the things we need to do to abate emissions? This is not complicated. Mm. Our enemy are emissions. And we have to go after the emissions and therefore cannot afford to build out a whole new infrastructure of one fossil fuel or another that is going to be with us for 20, 30, 40 years uh, unless they are able to capture those emissions. We don't have that indication yet or even that full capacity. Yeah, and there were a lot of ifs in there as well as we look ahead to some of the plans. Um, yes, but your hand was, um, was down despite your efforts. Talk to me about, about your view, because I think... My hand was, was up. Was it up? Yes. It was hidden. Absolutely. Oh, my goodness, seven and a half. I felt so lonely. Sorry about that. There you were, isolated. OK, mm. you're going to have to wait then, because I, I, want, I want someone on... In fact, no, go on. OK. Why? <laughs> well, <laughs> you know what, mind, I, I thought to myself, what have I done raising my hand to that uh, question? I think it's a lovely question to ask, but I, I thought about getting married when the question was, will you love each other for the rest of your life? And the answer, of course, has to be yes at that moment. But then the, the topic is, you know, <laughs> you, you know the, 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 because I'm here, I uh, committed to this course. And you're on stage. So if I started to yeah, hesitate at that nice. moment, it would feel wrong from a leadership perspective. Uh, but if you, if you ask me what, what the question is, Wait, I so think did you lie? It is a how question for was me. That, was it a lie? No, but to say that, for me, it's, it's really, and I'm fully um, uh, with you as uh, uh, Commissioner Kerry, uh, we, the optimism is that we have started to close the gap. There is optimism in so many movements uh, that I see, and I wish I could uh, uh, share with all of us uh, because I, see, I truly see the solution coming. Are we there? No, we're not there. But I think the question is rather how do we get to it? Because 1.5 is not the target. Many people think it's a target. It's a planetary limit. <laughs> so th therefore, I think the question in itself almost invites to doubting it. Right now, we need to commit to it, and we need to commit to the gaps and closing them. It's a matter of existentialism for uh, uh, humankind, so therefore I raised my hand. Sorry. Yeah, no, uh, you don't have to apologize. You have to tell the truth, though. Um, 
uh, Anna, come in here because you believe this can be done in one generation. That's what you're committed to. And you've said, look, we can do this, but we have to jumpstart investment. And I think at the crux of all of this, and it goes back to the point about money, money, money. Talk to me about your thoughts here. No, but I think that um, with the effects of global warming and the need to reduce CO2, uh, but also with all the fossil-free technology development that is now happening, I think that as a leader of a business, you clearly see how the market prerequisites have changed massively. And I think that's a driving force that we have not sort of untapped the potential of yet. And that is also why I clearly state that our sort of business strategy to enable a fossil-free living within one generation mm. is exactly that. It's our business strategy. Because if we are going to be... Um, if we are going to be competitive and be able to capture these business opportunities, we have to move there. And in, in addition, it's actually much more uh, risky or costly to not move mm. than to move in this direction. And I think that if you really look at this from a business prerequisite perspective, you clearly see that. And that movement has not fully developed yet. I love that idea. The costs actually are far greater than what we're arguing over, not Absolutely. being willing to spend or do today. Um, Jennifer, you're, you're half, so I feel like you've sort of been yes this camp where you're like, must say yes, yeah. not sure. <laughs> Talk to me about your position. Well, I think, you know, you, you noted all of the horrific impacts that happen yeah. are happening. That's not going to go away, right? And so the pressure on companies, on governments, also from youth, we have a very active youth movement mm -hmm. in Germany and around the world who are incredibly important. That's not going away. So... The technology is there, the, um, the, the recognition of the science is there, the costs are slowly getting incorporated in. And I just think, you know, even if you want to wish that it's, you know, those that don't want to go in that direction, I don't think there's gonna be much choice because I think the instability that will continue to be created by these impacts, real instability for people, deaths for people and, e and ecosystems, are going to keep that pressure up. And I think, um, and that's needed to have that pressure up. Um, is it immensely challenging? Will we get there? I don't know. Am I petrified that we won't? Absolutely, because of what it means. Um, and therefore, we're doing everything that we can to keep it in sight. But I just think this question always is about the cost of action and all of these other things, and it's not taking into account the national security implications. Mm -hmm the instability that are there, the impacts, the lives that are just going to make it harder to not take the decisions that need to be made. Helen, I, I left you till last on purpose, primarily because you created a flood behind <laughs> us on purpose, and perhaps. Um, I think you have to give us the perspective, the reality, the fear, I think, and, and the life cost, the human cost of what we're fighting here. How concerned are you and how sure are you that we'll either miss or not these targets? And what does it mean from a human perspective? Yeah. I think that, first of all, it's, it's really important to address, and uh, Secretary Kerry just addressed this in the beginning, um, uh, we are not on pace on, on, on climate. We have to pick up the pace on climate. Yep. We're going completely in the wrong direction, and it's uh, something that we are feeling on the ground. Uh, I've, uh, I mean, my community was washed away by floods uh, only two, two and a half years ago. Um, devastating impacts uh, on, on my community. Um, and I come from an indigenous community in the Amazon rainforest, and I think many times when we're in these spaces, we're talking about cutting emissions, we're talking about how, um, you know, these, all these clever calculations uh, of how we're gonna cut carbon emissions. Um, but really indigenous people have been facing the, the, the been on the front line of uh, the extractive industries for decades now. I mean, I have neighboring communities that live in, in that have oil in, the, in, the, in their water because of what the oil industry did in their communities. And now we have them causing the, this global issue of, of climate change. Um, and I mean, emissions are not going to be cut if we don't actually keep fossil fuel underground. Let's begin with actually attacking the root cause of it. 
we can talk about cutting emissions all we want and come up with clever uh, you know, calculations and, and do it on paper, but if we don't keep fossil fuel underground, we will not meet 1.5. And if we look at the state of the world at, what is it, 1 point, around 1.2 right now, it's already devastating. Look at what happened in Pakistan, an entire country that's been washed away. Um, I think that uh, we're, I mean, uh, right now we're, we're I, I, can, I kind of hear a lot of talking about the, that uh, the green hushing instead of uh, green washing, and I, I found that a really interesting conversation here, how companies are now uh, kind of taking back their commitments or holding their tongue because they don't want to commit too much because of the state of the world, right? Um, but we are not treating the crisis as, for example, the, the uh, you know, the, the uh, energy crisis in Europe that is now uh, fueling uh, the kind of making countries justify a new coal mine um, in, in Germany, we're not treating that crisis in Pakistan equivalently to what's happening in Europe. And if you think about it, our communities have been facing natural disasters for decades, right? And it's only been exacerbated in the last couple of years. Oh, you know what? You've given me so much material there. The question <laughs> is, I can go to Secretary Kerry on keeping uh, oil and gas in the ground uh, rather than tackling perhaps emissions. Because I think part of the reality is, and the IA has said this, even if we hit the Paris climate targets, around half of our energy needs are still going to come from fossil fuels, even by 2040. That's the reality we face. Or I could go to Germany and talk about coal. <laughs> and I know Germany said that look, we're still going to hit the targets for, for 2025, but it's tough to say to other nations, hey, you know, get your house in order when things are going in the wrong direction, energy security irrespective. So let's go there. Let's talk about this but also with a prism, I think, as well, of what's just been done in the United States with subsidies to fuel the technologies to tackle this and um, the sort of concerted, concerned response in Europe. Secretary Kerry? Which one? Good question, my friend. <laughs> you get to choose. <laughs> you, you, how about, I tell you, you, you could talk about the IRA afterwards. Um, <laughs> Fatih Birol of the IEA makes it very clear that if we wanted to, we can achieve the 45% minimum reduction the scientists have told us we must achieve by 2030. We could achieve it just by deploying renewables, right. not by opening up new fossil fuel projects. So. There's a fair amount of momentum, obviously, in the marketplace and in some very powerful businesses to continue business as usual. Um, I also think we have to be honest about the other side of that ledger, which is we will continue to have uh, gas, particularly some oil, because they're used in different kinds of products and so therefore they will be drilled. And the issue is, how do we use them? Uh, gas, per se, sitting in a tank is not a problem as long as the process of extracting it was green, which it isn't usually. But if it is, it's not the gas alone sitting there that's the problem. It's how we use it. It's the burning of it. It's the byproduct of it. And until we can capture those byproducts, uh, there's a certain responsibility that will fall on that industry to live up to the obligations that we've all agreed on. But do you agree they need pushing harder? I spoke to the Occidental. Pardon? They need pushing harder. The well, they, but they CEO absolutely need to come to the table and be partners in this effort because we can't get there if, if those practices aren't changed. That's part of the doubt about where we're going. Will we capture emissions? Uh, you know, gas is an automatic 30 to 50 percent reduction in emissions just because it's gas, it's cleaner than oil and coal, particularly. Mm. But once you burn it, you're still putting emissions up, which, if we're going to get to net negative by 2050, even after the 2030, which we could achieve with only the renewables, you're still going to have to be reducing emissions at a fairly steep curve. Now, there's a lot of work being done in CCUS, carbon capture, utilization, and storage. There's a lot of work happening in battery, uh, longer term storage, in uh, green hydrogen, and it may well be, and the, here the gas and oil industry better watch out in the sense that 
the marketplace going to decide this? And if the price keeps going where it's going in these new technologies, they're going to be priced out of it. And that's why a lot of them are now doing R&D and developing in alternative renewable and other possibilities. So it's just not a, it's not a simple kind of uh, answer, except to say that we could be doing a much better job of holding people to a tough standard on the emissions, because the emissions are what are taking us in the wrong path. Yeah, target the emissions. Yep. That and coal, coal in Asia particularly. There's too much coal. Some new coal is being brought online today. This, that's just not, you know, shouldn't be allowed. It is allowed. It's going to happen in a number of countries because that's all they have. It's the only way they keep their economies going. So we have to have an accelerated effort to guarantee we're abating and moving. We cut the deal with Indonesia last year, the Jet P. We will be closing down some coal. We will be deploying additional renewables, but there's still too much coal. And, and to meet the curve, we've got to go on of, of decline in emissions. We've got to be reducing coal at a faster rate. When do you cut the deal with China? We're working on it. Okay. <laughs> right now. <laughs> just checking. Yes, but you were giving me the look. Do you want to make a comment here? No, I, I just think, you know, uh, first of all, I think it's, uh, it's really n not a race against technology. I would even argue not against uh, finding capital. It's, uh, it's uh, against the clock. So we, we were late in realizing uh, what we have done and what we are. Uh, so I think back to, to Helena's uh, witnessing that the whatever we do, even in the best scenario, we, we will uh, pay the price for uh, previous generations, ignorance and our, our own generation as well. So I think th it's all about uh, race against time. I see with optimism from our own value chain in IKEA where we have invested uh, billions, uh, more than three billions into renewable, wind, solar. And a few years ago, it was debated if that was smart. Today, I don't think anybody's <laughs> debating that. And I wish we would have been even faster uh, in, in deploying our plants. Um, so there is a lot of, I think, reaffirming of that we are on the right track. We have the medicine and we can free ourselves uh, from carbon. Um, but as much as I, I would love to come back to the discussion on how do we uh, address the, uh, the issue of bringing up more carbon from the ground. How do we deal with that? And how do we at the same time double up on investments for renewable? Because we know what the recipe is. And then of course, to, to Helena's point also, we need to spend much more time in realizing the cost and the actions uh, connect, connecting to, you know, basically dealing with the consequences and adapting. Yeah, I have to say though, listening to that, I don't worry about the ignorance in, in our generation and generations past. When these guys mm. are in charge, I don't worry about that. We've just got to protect the planet and improve the situation till, uh, till they get there. Anna, and yes, Jennifer, but Anna, you, you were... You no, but I, I very much agree with yeah. Jesper that both the technology, the knowledge and the capital is actually there. The question is, what do we do with it? And how can we work in several dimension as, uh, dimensions? at the same time. Collectively. Yes, and, and maybe just to give a few examples on how we do that from a business perspective. I mean, first of all, we of course transform our own business and our own asset portfolio, phasing out the fossil part of our business uh, and making sure that we increase the investments into fossil-free technologies. And we're mainly doing that by being one of the main offshore developers of wind in Europe, but we're also looking into investments of, uh, of nuclear. And I think we need all the fossil free technologies to sort of manage this. But, but then I think it's important to look at it from a business sustainability point of view, because as a business, you need to be sustainable financially, you need to be profitable uh, in order to do good business, but you also need to be sustainable from a climate perspective. Mm. To me, it's not uh, you know, either or. So we are committed to be in line with the one and a half degree trajectory of the Paris Agreement. We have committed to be net zero by 2040, not only in our own business, but in all parts of the value chain, scope one, two, and three. Um, and I think that that also, of course, includes biodiversity and other aspects of, of sustainability. And I think the third thing that I would like to spend just one minute on is that we are looking into how to develop new business models together with industries that are emitting a lot of CO2 today. Because I think that if you look at the business models end to end, and maybe not the way they look today, mm. you can actually accomplish a lot. We do, for example, fossil free steel together with SSAB and LKAB. It's already there, it's working, it's on the market, but it needs scaling up. We do uh, a pilot project on sustainable aviation fuel together with Shell, Scandinavian Airlines and Lansatec. 
where we use captured carbon and green hydrogen in order to produce uh, electrofuels. And we do similar things in cement and plastic. And I think then you can sort of unleash entire value chains rather than only looking at your other business, but do profitable business growth at the same time. It's such a great point. It can't be the core business. This cannot overtake the core business because you have to be a viable business first and this has to be adopted in almost automatic. It has um, to be integrated with the core yeah, business. Yeah, it does. It has to be synonymous, but it can't, like I say, it can't be the core business. Otherwise, and that's what I hear from the business community all the time. It's like, how do we balance the two and, and make them synonymous in that respect? Um, I was going to ask you a question. Do, do they come to you very briefly or are you going to them? Are they coming to you and saying, look, help us, we need to fix this? Uh, you mean the these industry? The clients that you're talking uh, about? It differs in different uh, areas. So when it comes to the steel, it was the steel company who had an idea. Uh, and they sort of searched sparing partners in order how to make that work in okay. reality. Uh, and when it came to the sustainable aviation fuel, it's what's more on our initiative. So it differs. Funny That's that. That's what though. happens when you meet in forums like this and can have good conversations. Yeah, people get ideas yeah. and those things grow. Um, Jennifer, you wanted to come in. So we have the coal situation, we have the coal question. Um, Lots of different things. I'm happy to talk about that. I also was kind of responding to this, you know, we can we can rest easy because we have people, young people who are now active, and, and for me, it's our generation that has to take the action. Yeah, not rest easy, but, yeah. you know, give it, give, us, give them a few years, a no, couple of decades. No, but, but we don't have. We don't have a few years. No, no, no but we have to give them a planet to hand over to, yeah. I, you know, to hand over to them. Sorry, I wasn't suggesting that we could rest on the laurels. No, I Far just... From um, it. Yeah. Just I'm, to clarify. Um, so, I mean, I think just on the on what's happening in Germany, um, I think, um, look, what what the Russian War of Aggression did was it was a huge wake up call um, about um, number one, dependency on one country for so many of your energy, and number two, a dependency on fossil fuels, and the risks that come with that. And so, what Germany has been doing is phasing out our uh, imports of Russian fossil fuels. And in order to then meet our energy needs, we started with the largest renewable energy bill in our history, 80% uh, renewables by 2030 will come online. And not only that, but also looking at these questions that um, Secretary Kerry was raising about permitting. So also moving from seven to two years so that mm. you can actually move that mm. forward. Those are tough questions and the implementation of, of the um, renewable energy future. We also are working on energy efficiency law. We've put, you know, um, had to find other partners like Norway and, uh, and certainly the Netherlands in importing gas. We will import less gas at the end of this and have an earlier phase out of fossil fuels than before the Russian war of aggression. We also, because of, of, of the war, had to had to have some coal-fired power plants in reserve, which is an incredibly painful decision to make. But our coal phase-out, North Rhine-Westphalia, will be 2030. We're working on 2030 in the east. Four villages were saved, one was not. Incredibly difficult situation, incredibly difficult. Understand I completely the, the frustration and the, of, of youth. Um, and uh, for me, it's a signal, I think, not just for Germany, but if you have that level of engagement um, from young people, um, that's not going away either. And to me, as a decision maker, <coughs> right, um, those voices, we talk about vulnerable communities, we talk about that. Well, in our country, that's often youth, and we actually have a Supreme Court finding in Germany that found in favor of youth that we had to reduce emissions sooner. Therefore, the 2045 greenhouse gas binding target. So we're on the case. We've had to make some very difficult decisions. I have confidence, I think Minister Habeck has, that we'll get there also on climate. I think what Germany has been through in the middle of this crisis on energy and what we thought we might be seeing last summer and where we are now, which is in a stable situation, um, working on climate and energy security gives me some security that we can also do that as a society on climate. Because we had to take care of the low income co populations. We had to make sure that that is there. And, and that's a societal conversation that we need to be having with business, but also with youth, with, um, with elderly, with the whole society. That's the conversation that's needed. Concerted industrial policy, government policy, matching and working together, yes, Bill? No, I just wanted to build on what, what Jennifer was speaking about. I think, I think one of the uh, challenges, and maybe the myth is also that we need to bust, is um, 
when it comes to people, the many people out there. So we know from, from a fact in our research in IKEA, and it's been verified by other institutes as well, that uh, the concern, which is a good thing, the, the global concern is on a very high level. It doesn't matter if you go to China, if you go to Sweden, if you go to the US, the concern for climate is, is uh, out there. Seven out of 10 in our statistics are, are deeply concerned. Then comes an interesting and sometimes maybe worrying fact, how many are prepared to pay for uh, the shift we need to do? And in our research, it's 3%. I heard uh, BCG referred three to 9%, so maybe that reflects also our customer group. And the common misunderstanding here is that people don't care, but it's wrong. People simply don't, ha simply don't have the money. So they expect us as uh, government leaders, as corporate leaders, of course, to solve it. If you're a single mother living in 55 square meters, uh, trying to figure out life, maybe you work double shifts, etc. cetera. Uh, obviously, it's the wrong thinking for us to think that, to invite you to be part of, to pay a premium. And here I think comes, even if it's difficult in reality in certain aspects, in general, we have to believe that wasteful use of resources is costly. Smart use of resources, whether it's energy, whether it's material, it must be smart from a cost perspective. So I think what I'm trying to, to really work with is, in order to get there in time, which was your first question, we need to tie it to, to the new economy. We need to transform our economy. And there we know today we can do a lot. Corporate community, we can do a lot. You do a lot, um, uh, Anna. But to a certain extent, we also need a totally different uh, collaboration with the leaders of uh, policy makers basically around the world. Help us shift subsidies to the right places, incentivize and make us move faster. And it will happen. I mean, we know the demand growth in the coming decades is all going to be in emerging developing markets. And the Western world, the richer nations may be saying in certain cases they don't have the money. Well, we need to flood them with money too. We'll come back to that point as well. Jennifer, I know you just wanted to make a point there very quickly Just as well. a quick one. I mean, I, I totally agree. And I think that is in the hand. That's why we need a social ecological transformation. And I think that there are very real conversations now with countries, developing countries. That's where the finance question comes in. Right reforming the international financial institutions to create a different alternative economic mm. pathway there. And countries who are here um, from developing countries are, are open. They want it. They don't want an extractivist economy anymore. Uh, Secretary Kerry, we just talked about this um, on television, about the idea of, and it's got to come down to the IMF and the World Bank ultimately, just on this point, and the idea that the shareholders need to have a conversation and an understanding that they have to perhaps accept more risk, they have to accept with that risk comes loss in order to work with the private sector and get more private sector money into emerging markets, to developing nations, to develop technologies. Mm -hmm. And the upside there is there may be profits too. Let's be clear, startups, the technologies that we've been talking about are the biggest shareholders of the likes of the World Bank and the IMF, to, to Jennifer's point here, ready to take a little bit more risk and accept that that might mean some losses and also some profits, let's be clear too. Are they ready? Absolutely. Uh, I think they're hungry, impatient, and I think there will be a considerable dialogue about this and effort made over the course of the next few months. The spring meetings of the bank are in April. The World Bank and the banks come together in Washington. Um, we are the largest shareholder of the United States, but our other sister and brother shareholders are critical, Germany, France, Britain, UK, Italy, Spain, and so forth. I think every single one of them that I've talked to is really impatient to get reform because that reform, which will not require profound change in the charter, it will not take away their triple A rating. It has the ability, if you follow the rules, but do it the right way, to significantly increase the amount of money that is available Leverage. for concessional lending. But, but let, me, let me just point out something here so people understand this connection when I say money, 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 money. I, I heard myself being quoted yesterday, and I said, God, I sound like Gordon Gecko on Wall Street or something. I actually sang it today, uh, like an ABBA song. But, uh, <laughs> but look, here, here, here's the reality. You have big financial institutions. They play by rules all around the world, different in some places, but they play by rules. They also have clients. I mean, the money BlackRock has, for instance, is mm. vast majority is owned by individuals, by entities. Mm. And, and they want that money treated in a certain way. And everybody has a fiduciary responsibility. Those who manage money or invest money 
And you can't just throw it away, uh, and nor will they allow that to happen competitively between them. So you have to find a way to be able to motivate that money to see the virtue of investing in one of these slightly riskier conceivable, but not, not altogether. So it, well, let's look at the other side of the ledger. You have countries in Africa that desperately want to be able to do better by their citizens. And they want to be able to provide them energy. They want to create jobs. But to do that, they have to develop. And this is a fundamental development challenge, which is historically understandable. You don't have a revenue stream. You can't go to the market. So you have to find cheap money. You have to find money that's either giveaway money, philanthropy money, or budget money from Germany, which is quite incredible, put amazing money last year into the deal with Egypt. Couldn't have done it without Germany saying, we're going to put up you know, 100 billion uh, euro. And, and uh, not 100 billion, it was, uh, excuse me, one billion. We bought one over, it was 100 million. 100. 100 million that combined with others to get to about 500. Mm -hmm. And that leveraged, that gives you the ability to de-risk the deal because those entities can take the first losses, which allows the people managing the money or owners of the money to say, okay, uh, we can do this now. We're not going to be in last in line for repayment. We may even be first in line, depending on how you structure it. So this is the, the magic that we need, is to unleash those trillions of dollars that are looking for good investments, but they're looking for bankable investments. And, and there's a distinction here. So with the combination of blended finance, you have public money, philanthropy money, uh, money that may be concessionary, and we'll talk about that, like the World Bank, et cetera, and you add that to the larger sum of money that will actually make the deal happen, which can make money. And, and so if you have a 25-year PPA, a, a power purchase agreement, at a certain tariff that may increase with inflation or whatever, you could invest in that, and pension funds can feel safe investing in that. And there are plenty of kinds of deals that produce that. Revenue producing transportation, for instance. You pay for transportation. Water treatment facilities, you pay for the water in certain places. Electricity, you pay for the electricity. So any of those revenue streams that we could now harness the energy of that motive to make some money, to feel safe, that's how we will accelerate this, this operation. And we're trying very, very hard to find ways to augment that pool of money that can leverage the other money. You can get a billion dollars, let's say. Leveraged, that can be six, seven to ten billion dollars, which you then are investing to create this transformation. So this is doable, no question in my mind. We're working on a new uh, structure where, where it's called the ETA, which is a uh, accelerated emi an emissions transition accelerator which would allow a company to actually buy a credit, uh, particularly important right now because some companies have been really good actors and they've gotten to about 80, 85, 90% of scope one, but they can't do the last 10%. Why? Because there aren't enough electric vehicles to purchase or there, aren't, there isn't a smart grid to be able to take part in. So until that happens, you don't want to lose those people from being able to be part of this transition. So if you're going to let them buy a credit temporarily for a number of years only for the purpose of reducing those coal emissions or the fossil fuel emissions and deploying renewables, that's a virtuous. I've been an environmentalist all my life. I, I opposed them when they were not thought out and there weren't any guardrails. But it's possible to do this in a way that gets you some cash, which you then use to leverage further reductions while you're bringing the other things online that help those companies to be, you know, uh, uh, fully performing. This is the hallelujah moment because this is how you get from A to B in my mind because you scale the money that is available. And I hope we get to the point where there's too much money and too few products and we're like, where can we put this money? Because I think that would be um, uh, the ultimate first class problem. Um, we're going to come back to this in a second because, Helena, um, I want to ask you what you think because this is something that could be incredibly transformative. Does this give you uh, more hope and confidence? Um, and be honest. If the answer is no, it's okay. Yeah. I think that w when I hear a lot of these conversations, I think, uh, you know, it's a very business first and then we'll deal with climate and then we'll deal with bi biodiversity loss. And as a secondary consequence, we will might save the planet. And that needs to be reversed. Uh, 
first comes life, first comes planet, you can do whatever you want after that. Can they come all That's together? That's secondary. Because um, the world I, flows on money. I haven't seen that. I haven't seen that yet. I've only seen uh, you know, profit be being prioritized above a healthy planet and, and the well-being of people. Um, and I think I, it's something that the uh, head of the UN said this morning was that you know, the, the business model is, is, is not inclined with the survival of humanity. Um, and that's something that he said in this very forum this, this morning. And, uh, um, you know, uh, putting business first is exactly what has led us to the point that we're, where we're at right now. Um, and, and I think that, you know, especially coming from the Amazon rainforest, uh, we have thousands of hectares of pristine rainforest. And the only ask that we have uh, is to let the forest stay up, right? Let's let the forest stay standing. That is the most simple solution that we can find. We find that solution in nature. It's already there. <laughs> and the technology, it's great, but it's not a priority. It's not what, what's going to solve the climate crisis. It's not what's going to solve all these issues that we're facing on the ground. Um, and I think that in this very building, we have people that are enabling that those crimes against humanity and against planet. Uh, and, and, you know, let's, I guess, like, let's not get confused here. We're, we're talking about not expanding on fossil fuels. We're talking about not continuing to enable new, new fossil fuel development. That's what we're asking. We don't want any new oil wells. We don't want any new coal mines. We don't want anything, any new um, uh, fossil fuel development. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the, Even if it's the existing neutral. reservoirs, they are there, and there's not much we can do about it. Uh, but for myself and for the next generation, we don't want to, to have, you know, we cannot allow to see decisions being made that is furthering the development of the fossil fuel industry. And this is going to lead to huge consequences on the ground, and we're already seeing that. When I walk in these uh, hallways, when I'm sitting in these spaces, we really lack the sense of urgency on the ground. We really, really, really need to see it that way. And, and uh, you know, it's, it really comes up to, you know, really strong and, and ambitious uh, leadership and decision-making, boldness. I'll defend business in one respect in that I know a lot of CEOs who, and this entire panel, quite frankly, as well, who, who care deeply and put a lot of money into philanthropy in trying to continue to hire more people and create jobs. And business has responsibilities in ways that they don't fulfill, but they also do a lot of good things and keep the economy moving. Um, I did have one CEO, I will say, say to me today, the biggest and best technology ever formed for carbon capture is a tree. Please protect the Amazon rainforest, to, you, to your point there. And I, I think it's a, an important point. Um, and and it, doesn't, it doesn't right. solve the entire problem, though, because what we need is standing for us. We don't, the, the planting trees is, is a good initiative, but what we need to do is keeping, uh, you know, pristine rainforest that has entire ecosystems alive. And We're talking about biodiversity, um, and, and that's what needs to be at the center of the agenda. I think these conversations are really important. They are really, you know, essential, but what we really need to be targeting, and we need to be talking, looking at the bigger pictures of the main issues and what we actually need to be solving. I'm going to take you at your word and say, okay, let's put all the focus now on renewable technologies, renewable energies. And Secretary Kerry, you and I talked the last time in Davos in May, and I, I tried to say to you, promise me you'll get a deal done, and you couldn't make a promise, but you did it. And I think the United States needs congratulating for that T to such an extent that the, the Europeans are complaining. And there is an irony there in that they were complaining about Donald Trump several years ago pulling the United States out of the, the, the Paris Treaty, and now they're complaining when you actually do something about it. And... Um, feel like it's perhaps... But we're complainers. Beyond, yeah. There's nothing wrong with complaining. Um, I understand, honestly. I think Jennifer would tell you and, and uh, President Biden would tell you uh, where there are some uh, concerns, uh, we want to try to work with our friends to work through those concerns. But writ large, taking out one provision here or there that may affect automobiles or one thing or another, the basics of the legislation are exactly what we need. And it's gonna have a profound, it's already having a profound impact because it's providing incentives to go out and do the discovery and do the R&D and deploy these new uh, technologies. And, and uh, you know, I think our, our point of view is we need more of it. We need, you know, Europe already spends an enormous amount of money, but 
Let's go, folks. All of us need to be doing even more. Frankly, we wanted to do more than what we've already done in the Inflation Act, which is extraordinary. Right. President Biden started at a trillion plus. That's a 369. It's actually going to be a lot more than that because it's not, it's not amount so, so, you know, conscribed. It's, it's uh, how, many, how many people qualify for the tax credit. So you could go up to 800 billion conceivably. That's going to kick things into gear. Yep. Jennifer, very quickly. Europe, do more. Stop complaining to yes this point. I didn't say well, that. Well, first of did. all, we have U.S. legislation on climate. Congratulations. It's incredibly important, yeah. and that is something to celebrate uh, in a major way. And I think I fully share we're, we're, we're working it through. Um, and I think you see also a lot of collaboration on technology, on standards um, between Europe and, and the U.S. And, yeah, game on. <laughs> well, you talked about a race to the bottom though, in terms of emissions rather than anything else. Oh, I um, think, I, I, seriously, I think um, uh, Ursula von der Leyen made an important speech yesterday. Mm. I mean, um, moving, and I think that's this, this issue of needing collaboration and ways of collaborating, also on things like a bioecological bioeconomy, which, yeah. which you know, yeah. um, that is good for indigenous peoples and, and local communities, but then also the competition that drives things forward, uh, pace and scale of change, we need it. Yeah, healthy competition. Anna? It needs to be fair, but it'll be. Yeah, I, I would <laughs> like to emphasize three things because I think that a lot of the solutions are there and a lot of things are in the motion. And I think that we're sometimes forgetting that. So the question is how can we get the pace up? Yes. Because the pace is definitely not where it needs to be. And I think in order to do that, we need to be both short-term and long-term at the same time. And I would like to take the European energy crisis and as, as an example here. Because, of course, we are in a situation where we need to make sure that people can afford to uh, heat their homes or uh, run their store or their bakery or their business. But we also need to be long term in terms of the transformation that we need to do. Because the root cause of the problem is a fundamental gap between demand and supply. Uh, and there is a demand for a lot of fossil free technologies and the first movers coalition that secretary Kerry is one of the initiators of is one very clear example of that but what we need is now a lot more supply of fossil free energy production in order to be able to be competitive going forward and i think there's a lot of good ideas in uh, um, in the european union but, but also on national level but i don't think that the implementation is fast enough mm -hmm. So I think that there needs to be a uh, stimulation of investments, a regulatory stimulation of investments, mm -hmm. rather than sort of hampering them, because we need a lot more of this fossil-free uh, technology. I mean, we are, uh, we are building additional uh, offshore wind power, additional nuclear, uh, additional battery storages, uh, et cetera. And we need more of that, but we need it much, much faster. Are you saying too much red tape? You need to get it's rid of way red too tape. much red tape, and it doesn't only go for energy generation, it goes for distribution of energy and it goes for industry de decarbonization. And I think that it's not about, for me, it's very important that it's not about being profitable or sustainable. I think it's impossible as a company in the future to be competitive unless you are sustainable from a climate perspective. And I think that it's perfectly possible to live a modern and comfortable life with a sustainable footprint. And I think it's up to us in the business community to really offer attractive and affordable, affordable customer propositions to enable that. Mm -hmm. That turns it on its head to go from a conversation where it's like, it's going to make me less profitable <coughs> to be more sustainable, to being an essential tool to be profitable and to be a viable business if you're not doing this. Um, yes, but you're the one of the chairs of the WEF Climate Alliance, and you were asked several years ago mm. to do this, and you said no, despite your morals, your views, um, and then it changed. Talk to me about the evolution of the conversations that you're having with the private sector, because I do want to talk about greenwashing. Mm, greenwashing tree hugging, actually. We'll come back to that as well. So I told you that in, in, uh, in uh, private. Yeah, you, no, oh, okay. Was that, no, that no, not uh, Maybe I, I will, uh, I will uh, comment well, on I have to you, say yeah. one thing. I, I think just to say, um, what, what, what you share, uh, Helena, is, is what's right. So until we close the gap to yeah. 1.5 degrees, you're right. And you're right also after, because of course we are learning as we go along that it's not enough only to address energy, it's about materials, it's about um, nature, it's about people. So in a way you can say, 
as we are progressing, of course, there are new insights, new uh, hinders, new surprises along the way, and I'm sure that's going to continue. But the, the, so the sto story in, in my case was I, I was curious to, to learn from the WEF uh, Climate Alliance, and yeah. uh, I decided not to be, be part of it because there was no commitment and there was no agenda. And these are, this is uh, a couple of years ago. And then the, the question was, if, if uh, we would change that, would that be interesting? And then, of course, it's hard to say no. And I, it's an incredibly source of inspiration to me to see a group of CEOs that are today 127 CEOs. If you, uh, uh, if you uh, uh, basically, if you bundle the carbon footprint of that uh, group of leaders, would it be a country would be the third biggest in the world? So then you say, of course, that's an issue. But here it is. Th this is a group of voluntary leaders who have decided to be climate leaders who are either committed to Paris on the way, not only to make a commitment, but actually to do the plans. And today we had uh, discussions around how, no nothing else, only on how do we break through, how, what are the barriers we need to move, how do we meet up with policymakers, what type of investments do we need to, uh, to make. So that gives me a lot of hope that we haven't yet seen the momentum of all the things that are actually being planned. And I would say the general sentiment is the biggest risk today is not to jump on the train of the transformation, which is, of course, risky for any venture. The biggest risk is to be left on the platform yeah. because you will not only lose out of the economic benefits, you will lose out from a taxation point of view, I'm sure, but you're going to lose out from a brand, from a recruitment of people, and in the end of the day, looking yourself <coughs> in the mirror uh, also. So I think if, if anyone is still on the platform, <laughs> it's time to get on the train. And doing so, you don't have all the answers. So if, if Helena would ask me questions, there would come to a point I say, I don't know. I don't have the answers, but I'm willing to take the, uh, you know, the challenge and the responsibility to make sure we close the gap and get to one point. A leap of faith, because and there has to be a lot of that. And that's Absolutely. always the case yes. in business life. You take risks. That's what businesses and business leaders do. Yeah. And also, had you said yes without there being any commitment, that would have been greenwashing in my case as well. So I think mm. it's a credit to you to say, um, what is this going to represent and what is this going to do? And then I'll jump on board and not be left on the platform or vice versa once I know we're actually going to achieve something. Secretary Kerry, can I ask you about this role of government, private sector engaging? It's pacing on this as well because the message we're hearing is, for the most part, I think there are corporates out there that want to do more. It's not a an ignorance. It's a, in some ways, I think, a lack of information, a fear factor of, of the... the red tape, the amount of paperwork, the amount of numbers, hiring that we have to do in a, a slowdown, an economic slowdown kind of environment. How do we get above that concern for the private sector that this is going to represent a huge burden that, quite frankly, I don't have time for? Because there is still this gap. And there it's huge. There, there, no, there is a gap. You're absolutely correct. And uh, bureaucracy is the enemy of all of us. Right. Mm. Uh, we, we don't have time to do business as usual. Mm. So we've got to break through, and good governance has got to step up and provide the framework within which you're certainly protecting the, the interests of your citizens at large, uh, but you're also facilitating the ability of business to deploy its capital and to make things happen here. You, as I said earlier, you cannot take 10 years uh, with endless litigation to decide whether or not you're going to deploy a, a, a wind farm mm. in a place where it obviously makes sense and where other people are deploying in some ways. So, um, but government, you know, there's a partnership here. We, I think we've, for the most part, in parts of the world, governance has improved in the last 15, 20, 25 years. Um, there are places where it hasn't. Uh, and, and they are being left behind. I mean, that is the problem for them. One of the reasons that certain parts of the world have not been developed is you have a combination of political risk and currency risk and governance risk, regulatory risk, all of which combine to say to somebody who wants to deploy their capital, I, I'm just not going to do it there. It's too risky. Um, and, and I know there's a sensitivity in many quarters um, of an impatience about, you know, that kind of reality. But it is a reality. I mean, you know, Winston Churchill said democracy is the worst form of government except for everything else. And that's kind of the world we look at today. 
Uh, so it's not perfect. It's never really going to be perfect, but you've got to work out the best you can. I think it's remarkable what we're doing today. Mm. I think we're moving at, at a much faster speed, but we need government. I mean, for instance, what the, what the U.S. did with the Inflation Reduction Act was basically create a framework which invited people to use their capital in certain ways. Didn't tell them they had to, didn't pick winners, didn't pick losers, but created a production tax credit, an investment tax credit, and people can go out and do their thing and compete in the marketplace. But you've got to facilitate that. On the other hand, I've come to believe after the years I've been in public service, and when I left being Secretary of State, I was convinced no government is going to solve this problem. Let's understand that. No government has enough money to plug those trillions and do what we have to do. So like it or not, we must find a way to create the incentives that bring the private sector to the table. This is a partnership that must be played out in order to win. And, and I believe the private sector is ultimately going to do this. I, I've met a bunch of young entrepreneurs who are doing amazing things in startups. They're taking risk. Their investors are taking risk. And they're producing new batteries that may have a longer life that allows you to balance your entire grid. Uh, I've seen folks who are chasing green hydrogen, people who are <coughs> putting together, uh, I mean, look at the people who've been working on fusion for years. <coughs> you talk about taking risk. I can remember when I went to the Senate in the 1980s, and, and we have a big fusion program in Massachusetts. It's still going, and it's now one of the lead ones. It's a, it's a, a Commonwealth fusion at MIT. And uh, they've had a breakthrough. but. Other than some federal money that's been put in there, a lot of people risk their money and put it there because they believe ultimately they're going to have a product that can produce revenue and you make some money. So the, the private sector is absolutely key to our ability to be able to win this battle. And the private sector is going to produce green hydrogen. Or, uh, and, and now we've created incentives to help make that happen. So uh, I, I really feel more confident about the direction we're moving in. The, the marketplace of the world is moving, folks. Mm. You ought to get excited about this. Mm. This is going to be the biggest transformation economically since the Industrial, original industrial Revolution. Absolutely. Four and a half, five billion users of energy in the world today. That's going to go up to nine to ten billion in the next 30 years. People are going to demand electricity, power, service, heat, comfort. And so this is a marketplace. And it's, it has the ability to be able to move very, very rapidly, I think, if we will create the right framework and unleash private sector ingenuity and innovation and capacity to get this done. And also, this doesn't happen without China being on board, by the way. But you told me you're working on a deal with them, so I'm going to take China your word. China is and I'm essential. We don't get there without China reducing emissions and being part of this. But I believe you're going to work on it. I think something is in transition, <laughs> sure. and that might happen. You've, you've made a promise now, so I'm going to hold you accountable. We have two minutes left. Jennifer, I knew you wanted to say something. Can you do it in, like, 15 seconds? I can, because, oh. yes, we need the frameworks, and so we need the policy frameworks, and so I am impatient, because I think companies, if they're frustrated with process, they need to engage in fixing it, oh. right? And so the policymakers that are there who will testify on the floor of the Senate, who will be in the parliaments, who will get the, the policies passed to create those frameworks, that is essential to get that working together because then you can move the money into the space, but not every company is there okay. making the right thing happen. Okay, I want a show of hands. Who believes that we will hit the Paris targets or at least, can I couch this, is a little bit more optimistic when we came into the room at the beginning? Show of hands. Even if you're lying to me, I love it. Congratulations, guys. Give us another hour and we will have <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready for it. <laughs> we actually have one, one and a half mm. minutes left. Go on. And it's I think to you. Tell us why we should care, because Secretary Kerry did make a very important point earlier in WEF, and that was that talking about this to the outside world, you, you're a tree hugger, you're a crazy liberal. There's still this perception that somehow too many people in the world aren't on board with the the need to tackle this. And I think you're the most passionate of everybody here about doing this. Give us the reason, give the non-believers the reason for why we have to protect our planet. Yeah, and I think as- and You've got as, one minute. <laughs> wow. Uh, <I'll laughs> and then I spill some water. <laughs> as the 
probably only person uh, on this panel born uh, in the 21st century. It's um, great to have the last word. Um, yes. This generation deserves it. Um, I think, uh, I mean, Right, we're talking about solutions, right? And we're, I was, I was, uh, I was talking about, you know, uh, how we—the only thing we want is a living forest, a standing forest. Uh, and and indigenous people have been the the people that have been protecting these forests. It's a it's a uh, it's a great contribution that needs to be recognized in every single space. Because if we ignore that, um, we will see you know, continuous human, right, human rights violations in indigenous communities. The same communities that are on the front lines of climate change, the same communities that are on the front lines of the extractive industries, the same communities that are making the biggest contribution in climate mitigation. Um, and, and what is it that actually makes indigenous communities do this work? It's, it's not business, it's not, you know, investments, it's not, Everything that we've spoken about here, it's, it's a mindset, it's a, it's a relationship with nature, and th that conversation is mm. essential in this. Because if we don't mm. integrate that into this conversation, then we're losing you know, uh, direction. Um, in my community, we call it the living forest. We see everything in the forest as a living being. It's a relationship of mutual respect um, and, and, uh, and a non-extractive. Um, and, and, and this is why we have been concert, you know, why we have dedicated our lives to the protection of the Amazon rainforest. And that's why when we're talking about climate, we need to make sure that indigenous people are at the center of decision making. We need to make sure that we're there from the beginning to the end, not through consultation processes, not through, you know, uh, some vague participation. It needs to be at the center of of solution, and we don't see that today. We don't see that direction to where we should be going today. Um, can I give you some? Can I give you some I have, I'll just, <laughs> and I mean, we're ending right now, but <laughs> we you know, up. Oh, but I'll, I'll just add this, and, and please do after that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I think that I mean the, 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 the urgency of, of 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 the youth. We put it together in the letter, um, Greta, Vanessa, and Luisa, and I urging uh, oil CEOs to phase out of fossil fuel, you know, immediately. Um, and we're, we're here at, at Davos to deliver that. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's, we have almost, we launched it a few days ago. We have over 900,000 signatures that are supporting it in a matter of days. It shows, you know, that the commitment of, of civil society, it shows a commitment of youth and where we want to be going. And I, and I actually want to end this with, with uh, an, an ask of, of um, uh, the climate envoys I'm sharing this panel with. Um, you know, the IEA, the IPCC, the Secretary General has been urging every single decision maker in the world to, you know, uh, to commit to no new fossil fuels, no new fossil fuel exp exploration. And yet, these decisions are being made, you know, when, in, in completely ignoring the, this pled almost from younger generations. Mm. It's, it's almost, you know, it, we've been advocating for it for years and we're still going into the wrong di direction. Can we walk out with a successful Davos and actually say, this is the commitment we have, we will not explore new fossil fuel. Is that a commitment that you can make to this new generation? Secretary Kelly, we do get lost. <laughs> it's practicalities versus passion and love and the heart of what we're trying to protect here in the planet. Secretary Kerry, I'm breaking all the rules. No, I, I want to be really respond. quick. I, I, yeah. I, look, I love and respect your passion and your voice is really critical in this, but I want you to know that today I met with your environment minister of Brazil, newly appointed by President Lula. We talked with Marina Silva about the forest, how we will have a different, a new approach. Uh, President Lula is coming to Washington in a few days. I am going down after that. Uh, we're going to be going into the forest. We're going to be uh, putting together with Indonesia and with the DRC, which has the Congo Basin, an entirely new approach. Tomorrow we're having a meeting with all of those players, uh, Indonesia, Brazil, and my co-chair of a new entity called the Forest, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Forest uh, Protection Partnership. Make sure to include Ecuador, my country also. In and we are, <laughs> we are going to be all inclusive and we are going to try to come up to save all of those great basins 
uh, with a new approach, an entirely new approach. And Ghana, uh, the minister from Ghana, Minister Jinnapur, is my co-chair of this new entity, uh, this partnership, and I think you're going to see a renewed effort, which I hope will give people some faith. And by the way, a lot of businesses are stepping up and saying, we're going to put money into this effort to save the forest. We know there are 25 million people there who are indigenous, who don't have a livelihood. It's going to take some money to help provide them. We get it. Uh, and I want you to have a sense that uh, if you work at it, sometimes these systems can actually produce something beneficial. And we're going to do our best. Um, we owe you a better planet. We'll work on it. The panel. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>